Since 1636, National Guard units have been serving the people of the United States. The soldiers, airmen, veterans, and civilians that make up the New Jersey National Guard have a legendary history serving during homeland crisis and foreign missions. These are their stories. Recently, we sat down with Walter R. Nall, retired New Jersey National Guard Army Colonel and Acting Deputy Commissioner of the New Jersey Department of Military and Veterans Affairs. Colonel Nall has over 30 years of public service behind him and begins his transition to retirement January of 2023. He has served on both the home front and overseas. Today, we will ask the Colonel about his military career, his experiences as an African-American officer in both the Alabama and New Jersey National Guard and the changes he has seen in the military over three decades of service. Colonel, thank you for taking some time today to tell us your story. Let's start with your initial entry into the military. When, where, and why did you join the military, sir? Well, I, I joined the military in, on April 18, 1983. Um, I was a sophomore at Troy State University in Troy, Alabama. Uh, my initial plan was actually to join the Marine Corps Reserves, but I had no transportation to get 45 miles up the way, so I went to the National Guard Armory uh, across the street from the school. I didn't really grow up in a military family. I, I had a brother that was in the Army, and then he moved on to the Reserves. Uh, my father was not a believer that uh, men of color should be in the military because of the, you know, the generation in which he grew up in. Um, you know, so he saw the you know, segregation, Jim Crow, uh, mean behaviors toward service members even after they have uh, been to war and back. So uh, he was not a fan of that at all. He didn't think there was a place for any uh, man or woman of color to be in the military. Uh, but when I did enlist, uh, he was still proud of me of uh, making a, a strong decision for myself. So even though your values differed, he, uh, he still respected what you were doing? Absolutely. That's pretty, it's pretty awesome. Um, can you give a, a brief timeline of your military career from uh, as broad as you can from 1983 to about now, so maybe important moments. Yeah. Um, did you come in as an enlisted go officer? Did you yes. get a straight officer? How no, did your uh, career progress? Yeah, I, uh, I enlisted as an E1, <laughs> uh, radio teletype operator. Um, which required a secret security clearance, which uh, I thought was pretty hot at the time. And, you know, being an E1, I made it to E3, uh, uh, but I had entirely too many people telling me what to do, and you know how that go. You know, one sergeant say one thing, the other sergeant say something else, and you stuck juggling, you know, juggling the balls there. So I said, the only way to make that better is not to stand on the side and complain, but be a, be a decision maker. So I was a college student anyway, uh, I enlisted as a sophomore, as I said earlier. I started OCS in my uh, junior year, beginning of my senior year. Went to state OCS in Alabama, Fort McClellan. I got commissioned in June. I graduated from college in May. Commissioned in June. I was at the artillery school in July. All in 1986. So 1986 was a big year for you. Big year, big year. I finished artillery school. Got assigned as a fire direction officer in a unit in Phoenix City, uh, Alabama, which is on Eastern Time, one of the only cities in the state of Alabama on Eastern Time uh, because it's close proximity to Fort Benning. And uh, did that for a few years, moved to New Jersey in 1989, assigned right across the way over here with the 4th of the 112 Field Artillery, then to the 1st of the 112 Fire and Battery Commander, Headquarters Battery Commander. Staff officer, and then the first of 112 closed. We had the case to colors, and our branch transferred to logistics, which was um, a challenge for me. I love the field artillery, there's no doubt about it. But I did branch transfer, and I became a force multiplier in that respect because now I know what the warfighter wants. So I can predict a lot of things, particularly when you're working with combat arms guys. And I think that's the beauty of being a combat arms officer first and then go into a different branch. You can see things from a different perspective. Uh, you can feel what the commander wants on the ground if you've been there yourself. So that, that was very helpful. And then it was off to Iraq in 05 and Afghanistan in 11. Now, in between that time, of course, you know, we had our emergency responses there, you know, bridge and tunnels and storms and things of that nature. That's, that's actually one of the proudest moments of uh, knowing that I was a guardsman. 
you know, when everybody else is hunkered down in the house, we're out there doing things that makes a difference in the neighborhood, uh, in the community, or across the state, uh, those impacted areas. It's not the other branches of service, it's the National Guard. So I was very proud of that, you know. Not necessarily putting your life on the line, but certainly being out in the elements when all others are encouraged to stay at home, still providing service. Would you say, I, I just want to add this, because you mentioned that the construct of the Guard. Yes. Um, What's that really meant to you? Because I, I guess from Alabama to New Jersey, you kind of call New Jersey and Alabama home, um, and you take pride in both. Or, yeah, I do. You know, and whether it was Sandy or Bob or Bill or any hurricane, um, is that very unique for you to how active duty may have been when you first came on and things yeah, of that nature? I, I think it's, it's a little closer to home, you know, closer to the heart because you see some of these uh, areas, you frequent some of these areas, you know some of the people. And it's, it's comforting for them to know that someone knows them. You know, that personal connection I think is, is worthwhile. One other couple of things I forgot is, uh, you know, I, um, I will see pre-mobilization training assistance element commander. So when the 50th Brigade Combat Team deployed uh, in 2008, 2009, uh, we were responsible for that 3,000 pack uh, deployment, you know, getting that pre-mobilization training done. And in between that time, you know, I, I took command. I, like I said, I went to Afghanistan, uh, but I was the, you know, then I rounded out my career in 57 Troop Command. The first person from Tuskegee, Alabama, to command the 57 Troop Command. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Yeah. You uh, you got in in '83. Mm -hmm. What have you seen change during your time in service? Uh, what's what changed out of many of them? Do you think stands out the absolute most to you? Well, I tell you what. A lot of things uh, have transpired, and I mean, I retired in '16, and a lot of things have transpired since 2016. So, one of the things were women coming into combat arms. That wasn't foreign to me. We had women at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, in the basic course for cannon artillery in 1986. The, I guess the caveat was they were not allowed to command firing batteries. They could command HHBs or headquarters batteries or the service battery that provide all the maintenance support and you know all the other classes of supply support for um, for artillery battalion. But now, you know, I, I think it's a I think it's a beautiful thing because now it's the great equalizer. Everything is a competitive sport, you know, regardless of where you sit, be it the next command, the next position, it's a competitive sport because that commander would like to have the best qualified on his or her staff. So it may be a, a young lady that, uh, that happens to be a cannon artillery officer, or it may be a young lady that just finished the ranger school. Uh, you know, it's fine. I believe that most systems are designed for people to be successful. And I fell into a trap myself as a captain, trying to blame the system when it was actually me. Okay, so when I when I got that good chewing out by my battalion commander Bill Fink, still love the guy. He chew, he chewed me out. He told and nothing he said was inaccurate. I had to go home and take a look, hard look in the mirror and find out that it was really me trying to blame other things for my inaction to not be competitive. I would just encourage everyone, make sure you start off in the mirror, <laughs> make sure you're doing your part, and that you make sure that you keep yourself competitive. I, you know, when we were deployed, I had a lot of young soldiers, you know, E3s, E4s, and, then, and we did a career development plan. We, my Sergeant Major, uh, John Humphreys and I, we did a career development plan for every single soldier and counseled every single soldier in that unit. 60 plus people, like an element headquarter size unit. And those that followed the plan, all were successful. Those that did not follow the plan, remained exactly where they were. It was not that long ago that the military was even segregated, uh, right. things like that. Coming through as an African American man, a very a young African American man in your early 20s, all the way to uh, the end of your career, uh, what was it like? as an African-American going, going through basic training all the way through uh, becoming a leader? Well, uh, I, I think it depends on the audience that I have at the time. I mean, I've gone through a range, a full spectrum. Some of my uh, more seasoned veterans, oh, really? 
or oh, I thought you would be the sergeant major. I didn't even, you're the first black officer I ever met. You know, so it comes down to, you know, depend on the audience and the age groups and, the, and those uh, demographics. But on the other side of that coin, you have people that say, remember that you're representing all of us. Okay, and uh, when I was in Afghanistan, my fraternity brothers and I would meet every Friday for dinner. And we talked about that a lot. And we're talking about 15, 20, in some cases, 25 leaders. Not always officers, you know, senior NCOs, contractors, uh, but management level contractors. And we talked about our obligation to the race, <laughs> believe it or not, because we're being judged for the race. So we have to make sure that we keep our uh, integrity about us, our wits about us, and make sure that we come from the right place when we make decisions. And make sure we're fair and equitable across the board. And get people to understand why those decisions are made. Sometimes it's not, I'm the commander, this is what I want, and that's it. Sometimes you have to explain the whys. Because it makes it more palatable for the people on the other end. So, how do you think things have evolved for African Americans within the services over the years? Um, I, I could be incorrect, but perhaps in the Navy back in the day, you could only be a cook. Right, right. Things of that nature. Um, what, what have you seen change for African Americans in the services? Well, that have evolved. I think, I think that things have evolved tremendously over the last 20, 30 years. Even in the latest 2022, last year, uh, we've seen a lot of firsts. You know, Marine Corps, first four star African American general. Um, that's uh, General Michael Langley, or um, or General Charles Brown, uh, just happened to be the first black chief of staff for the Air Force. The Vice Admiral uh, Michelle um, Howard, she was a skipper for a, uh, a naval warship that uh, helped the uh, USS Merce during that time frame. So, and um, just recently, it's a couple of weeks ago, I think it was like the 15th or so of uh, December, the Marine Corps had their first two-star African-American female, Lorna uh, Malak. So there are a lot of firsts as recent as last year, and I think we'll continue to get more of those in other branches of service, but we have to make sure that our minority officers, I'm making a broader net now, our minority officers and NCOs understand that they have to bring something to the table. They have to strive to be the next two-star, the next three-star, the next four-star. So, yes, are we talking about doing over and beyond? Absolutely. Did you think you had the potential to become a colonel when you joined? <laughs> if it wasn't for Colonel Bill Fink, I would have been retired out as a captain. So once he, uh, he adjusted my attitude, I went on and did the appropriate educational requirements for the Army. I think I've spent like five or six years straight military school just getting myself ready to be competitive. At that point, once you hit light colonel, you have, you know, you have nowhere else to go but up. So I had the time, I'm 806. I did not get to the war college. I think I was uh, in Afghanistan when I should have been at the war college. Time had passed me by there. I was running up against my mandatory retirement date. But it's been a great ride. It's been a great ride to leave as a brigade commander. And on the civilian side, I still was progressing with the Department of Military and Veteran Affairs. Started off at the Youth Challenge Academy as the first uh, commandant. So I did that for roughly a decade. Then I came to HR and did some special projects there. I did uh, EEO work. I did um, hearing officer work. I supervised one of the transitional housing programs. I was brought to the headquarters as a director of veteran services that covered down on both transitional housing programs, the cemetery, monuments, all benefits that touch a veteran in the state of New Jersey. And here I am now, getting ready to retire in the coming months as the Deputy Commissioner for Veteran Affairs, which means I picked up you know, the three nursing homes and some other ancillary things. So when I stepped through the door one September of 1994, right here at this headquarters to end process, I had no idea I would be sitting here. But if you apply yourself, make sure that you don't burn any bridges because you may have to cross over those again. Be fair, just, maintain your integrity. Sometimes it's okay to agree to disagree. 
but still accomplish your mission, stay mission focused, and you will progress. I, I know you briefly mentioned a couple of very high ranking uh, African American officers. Any kind of feeling side about that? Pride for for them, yourself, yeah, your your um, your ethnic background, things yeah, like that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because you know we have to make sure we have a, a, a broad cross section of positive images for our young people to see. It is attainable. Uh, I mean, I was just home for my uh, high school class reunion. Forty years, <laughs> forty years, right? <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> but anyway, uh, here we are. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm a retired 06, and I took a picture with all the other veterans in, um, in my class. They were all, well, my roommate from college, we went to OCS together. We did everything together. He got out as a captain, okay? And I am considered the highest ranked person from our class. And everyone respects that, and they're proud of me for that. And, and I respect them for their contribution to the military as well. So it, it was just a great time to just sit amongst veterans that you've known since Pee Wee football <laughs> or elementary school and just sit back and reminisce and talk and then share those uh, veterans' experiences. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. Um, you had mentioned earlier, um, if you pick out one moment in your career, it stands out and why, why? I know you mentioned uh, one or two things. I think, I think what stood out to me was after 9-11. After 9-11, it changed the whole dynamic. It changed the guard. It changed everybody's perception on uh, what it meant to serve. It called people into service. We didn't have a lot of, well after 9-11, we didn't have a lot of legacy equipment. We started getting upgraded equipment, better training, and then we became that force multiplier that was needed going forward. Some units went a little sooner than others, uh, but for me it was 04 uh, to 05 in Iraq. Some units went a lot sooner than that, you know, on the initial push and in, in, in that. But you know, those negative connotations, like like you saw in Rambo and all those type things, a bunch of guys just running off the summer camp and you know da 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 da. All those things are over. You know, they have been over for a long time, but I still believe there are people who think that's what it is. Even in the, um, in, in the deployment to Afghanistan, working for Special Operations Command, you know, there were some people that were a little concerned, you know, about the, uh, you know, this reserve component unit coming there. But what, what they quickly learned is that a battalion level commander that's an 05, that's not 10 years, that's more like 15, 20 years. You know what I mean? 15 years of service. Seen a lot, done a lot. You just don't get a sergeant major. You get a sergeant major that just happened to be a master mechanic, or just happened to be a black seal person, or it happened to be a school teacher, or happened to be any of these vocations. So those are force multipliers within the reserve component that you're going to get because we did more things for this command in the first 90 days than the, you know, the group ahead of me that was an active duty unit did for the entire year. Yeah. And they loved it. They loved it so much that they didn't want us to leave. But uh, January 2nd, we had, to be out of, we had to be out of theater. We had to pop smoke. But, but here's the deal. Based on the activities of the 119th CSSB uh, relationship, with uh, Special Operations Command, the 117th got a similar mission in a different part of the world because they knew that New Jersey Guard actually brought, you know, quality to the table, and they appreciated that. Types of units and sustaining those types of units is a competitive sport with every other state and territory associated with our U.S. military. So, um, yes, we like those. Nice, nicer MOSs, you know, the cyber security, that will always be here. It will never go away. Ground forces will always be here. It will never go away. Combat arms will always be here and never go away. UAS, yes, it will always be here. It will never go away to, you know, and, and, and bump up your intelligence uh, posture. So New Jersey has a, has a way of getting things done and sustaining them 
it just, it just depends on what the leaders want to go doing for going forward. What do, where do they really want to go? How about for yourself? What, what do you think your future holds? I know uh, you got another big date <laughs> uh, coming up here on the 12th and all. Uh, yeah, what, yeah. what do you have, Colonel Nall, well, for the future? Well, after 28 years of this and 33 years of, uh, of uh, military service, I think I just want to take a knee uh, for a little while, focus on family, make sure that I'm doing the right things by my family because I know they have sacrificed time and emotion and everything else based on my career. So it's time for me to sit back and just be still for a minute and just enjoy life. Do a little traveling and enjoy the journey. Advice, words of wisdom for veteran service members, recruits um, uh, of any background. I got, what would you say? What you got anything for? Them? I got I got plenty. So so let me let me say it this way. First, you need to find a good mentor. You need a good mentor. Everyone needs a shepherd. You know, I used to say things like. Uh, a commander need to be able to talk to another commander because they, they're the only two people that can relate to that. A chaplain needs a chaplain and everyone needs a shepherd. So find you a good mentor that's focused on your success, not their own success. You know what I mean? Um, and let them build you that way. Never place yourself in a position where you're not uh, competitive for promotions. Lean forward. Volunteer to take on the tough assignment. It will pay dividends later. Just, just a re couple of recommend recommendations. Always put your service before yourself. Keep your head about you when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. Just because people are acting a little erratic don't mean you have to act erratic. Keep your head about you when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. Maintain your integrity because that's all you got. At the end of the day, from the date of birth to the date of death, all you got in between that, that little dash, is your life story, but let's hope that it's based on integrity. Only speak when you got something to say. Okay? Don't, not just to speak, to say something. You know what I mean? So, uh, I would encourage that. Only talk about what you know about. You know, every conversation that comes up don't necessarily need someone to chime in. Uh, if you don't know the subject matter, it's okay to remain silent, take in the information, research it, educate yourself, and then reattack. I just wanted to touch real, real briefly. I know it had been mentioned about Tuskegee and growing up there. Did any part of the story of Tuskegee, its history and its heritage, play a part in you um, thinking about joining the armed forces? What I really wanted to do was be a uh, U.S. Marshal. That's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be in law enforcement. Uh, I did work corrections for a little while. Um, then I realized that I cannot work corrections because I started acting just like the inmates. That's just part of it, you know. And my friends saw it in me. I did not see it, but they saw it. So when I came out of that environment, I did something else, and hence Youth Challenge Academy. No, Tuskegee is um, known, you know, the Tuskegee Airmen. Everybody knows Tuskegee Airmen. And, uh, and believe it or not, short story, uh, but a good story. I was about seven, eight years old, and my brother's wife took us out to the airfield, and we met Chief Anderson. Now, Chief Anderson was the guy that you see on a lot of the photos with uh, Lady Bird, okay? That's Chief Anderson. The guy, you know, he's actually from this area. He's I'm from Pennsylvania area and he learned how to fly from New Jersey and he used to take trips back and forth across the country blah 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 but he was a primary trainer at the airfield with the Tuskegee Airmen now granted at seven eight years old you don't know who this dude is you just want to get in the airplane this is my first airplane ride with him with him in his little private plane <laughs> and we fly around the county and we point out things you know let you see your house from the sky and all, all this beautiful stuff but I didn't realize how important that guy was until I was an adult. And I drove by his house as a teenager damn near every day. But when I became an adult and understood how important he was, I stopped. And I just said thank you. You know, I didn't you know You didn't realize the importance. I did not happens. know how important he was, nor yeah. did he showcase how important he was. You know, he's a very humble guy. Humility. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you could pass by him in the grocery store. It was no big deal. 
you know, anywhere. And and that was that's so something skating. that you took with you. Yes, absolutely. I keep my humbleness about me. Uh, you know, you know, you know. If you look around in the office, there's not a whole lot of stuff up in the office. Is you know, and uh, was comp. I got all these plaques, certificates, and this. And right now, I I don't know where they're gonna go. You know, but. You know, Tuskegee is a small town, five, five, six traffic lights, you in and out. But we've had a lot of success come out of Tuskegee, and they're very humble people. You know, like the bands, the Commodores, and Seventh Wonder, and a couple other uh, smaller groups, and backup bands, the Mean Machine, and um, Ultimate Ford, they're primarily a Texas band. And we all grew up together, you know, plus or minus five, ten years. Your family probably knew the family that lived across town. It's just one of those type things. Small, small yeah, town. Yeah, small town, yeah. Was there a big difference between Alabama and New Jersey when you moved up here? Huge. What was the difference? I mean, I know it's not <laughs> on the list of questions. I'm just curious myself. Huge Was difference. there a difference in the Army, the culture, every part of it? The yeah. Army culture? Really? Yeah, the Army culture is completely different. <laughs> um, Alabama Guard is reflective of the Alabama character. And if people had biases, out. They will let you know that, and I can respect that. Whereas in the Northeast, I wasn't here 30 days, and I had my I had two negative experiences, and all you know that was just why why are we talking about this? You know, I actually an English town, and somebody thought I was trying to steal one of their watches or something like that because he was knocking his watches off the uh, counter that he didn't know it. He, he was doing something, and the counter the watches were flipping over. I grabbed the case, put it back, and of course now, you know, I'm trying to steal one of his watches. My watch is better than the watches that you're selling, homeboy. <laughs> Don't flatter yourself, okay? But we had to get the police involved. You know, it was, a, it was just a mess, you know, that type of thing. And I, th I think I, I respect those that have those biases that make them known up front. You know how to exactly, exactly how to handle it versus those that are doing it, you know, um, you know, in a clandestine fashion. Do you have anything else that you want to add? Um, it's really just a forum you can speak to civilian career, military career, met, uh, you know, anything to, um, you know, up and coming African American officers that aspire to be you or, yeah. or do take your career path? So, um, uh, you know, I think I, I pretty much laid out a lot of things, uh, but, uh, but for the broader masses, all of our minorities out there, not just black people, but all the minorities out there have been engaged in the military from the beginning, okay? And we have to make sure that we tell our own stories and not let others tell the story for you uh, because things are omitted, for the lack of a better word, or embellished in a fashion or even minimized in a fashion uh, based on gender or, or race. And that's sad. Let's tell the whole story. You know, one that sticks out with me was uh, the Teddy Roosevelt, San Juan Hill, charging up San Juan Hill. I did it all by myself. I believe the Buffalo Soldiers were there too. And I think they may have been there before you got there. You know, those are the stories. We keep dealing with this over and over again, where what's wrong with just telling American history for what it is and digest it? process it and move forward. Learn from it. Let's not repeat negative activities. Learn from it and keep going. That's inspirational for me. Another one is one of my fraternity brothers, uh, Charles Young. He was going to be retired out of active duty. This man got on a horse in Ohio and rode from Ohio to DC to report to the Secretary of Defense or Secretary of War I guess at that time to show that he was still fit for duty fit for active duty. A horse from Ohio to DC <laughs> to demonstrate that, that he was fit for active duty. Those are the hurdles. Uh, he did make it to 06. He was posthumously uh, promoted to Brigadier General a year or so ago, so I'm very proud of that. Those types of acts of courage, be it you know Buffalo Soldiers, Tuskegee Airmen, all the other ethnic groups that have these signature organizations that went out and did great things, we need more of that. And let's not minimize what they did. They did great works. 
You know, our Native Americans did great works, okay? And we need to showcase those. We need to showcase it, not hide it or minimize it, degrade it, you know. Let's, let's not do that. Let's just tell the whole American story. It's okay. We'll all be proud for that. That's it. That was a wonderful interview. Thank you for telling the story from your eyes. That was retired New Jersey Army National Guard Colonel Walter Nall. His captivating story is just one of many stories that we are excited to share. You can always follow the New Jersey Army and Air Guard on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and the New Jersey Department of Military and Veterans Affairs on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Information about both organizations can be found at www.nj.gov forward slash military. If you or your favorite veteran have a New Jersey National Guard story you want to share, please email the Public Affairs Office at kenneth.brown at dmava.nj.gov. Or for further information on New Jersey Militia Museum oral histories, or to participate in the program, please visit or contact Carol Fowler at the museum in Seagirt. Call 732-974-974. 4571 or email carol at carol.fowler at dmava.nj.gov. On behalf of the New Jersey Department of Military and Veterans Affairs Public Affairs Office, thanks for spending your time with us.